fracture. She was neurovascularly intact and she was placed into a removable wrist splint. So 14 year old male status post fall on the stairs with the right Salter Harris II distal radius fracture. Uh, it was closed, neurovascularly intact. He was closed, reduced and placed into a sugar tongue splint. So 13 year old male uh, with past medical history of Beals syndrome um, that had fallen and had this left distal radius fracture. It's neurovascularly intact and he was placed into a sugar tongue splint. So what is Beal syndrome? Sorry? What is Beal syndrome? Uh, it's a FBN2 um, gene mutation on the five, uh, chromosome five, Q23. Uh, you get camp camptodactyly joint contractures um, of your knees and elbows, scoliosis. Uh, there's, it's kind of similar to Marfan syndrome. You can also get ectopic lenses. Uh, next patient is a six-year-old male, status post fall downstairs. Um, he had been drinking the night prior, uh, did not know he had any injury and woke up the next morning with pain. He was found to have a right distal radius fracture and this AS, ASIS avulsion fracture. Um, he also had rib fractures for the trauma team. He was closed, reduced and placed into a sugar tongue splint and then he was made protected weight bearing on the right lower extremity. The 71 year old female status plus MBC with this isolated right third metacarpal shaft fracture. She was placed into AP slabs. The 25 year old female uh, who had a fall and was found to have this left occult radial head fracture. She was nervously intact. There was no block to chronosupination. Um, she'd be placed in a sling for three days and start for the range of motion. It's an 80 year old female status post MBC uh, with this right distal humeral shaft fracture. She was neurovascularly intact. Um, she was placed into a coaptation splint. We'll follow up in the office. This is a 77 year old male uh, who fell down the stairs and had this right medial clavicle non displaced fracture and then the uh, scapular body fracture. He was placed into a sling, made non weight bearing, and he was nervously intact. It's a 33 year old female uh, who fell on a stair with this right zone one base of fifth metatarsal fracture. She was placed in a posterior splint for comfort and made not, made not weight bearing. Morning. So a 10 year old male status was fall from a swing with a left distal both bone forearm fracture. He was neurovascularly intact, closed reduced and placed into a sugar tongue splints. The seven year old male status was fall from monkey bars with a right distal foot bone forearm fracture. He was also neurovascularly intact, closed reduced and placed into a sugar tongue splint. This is a six-year-old female with a right beta-1 Montasia fracture, so that's supposed to fall at camp. She was neurovascularly intact, was reduced and placed into a long arm bivalve cast. This is a six-year-old male, so that's supposed to fall off a trampoline with a right distal and tibia fracture. She was neurovascularly intact, was reduced and placed into a long leg bivalve cast. It's a 29 year old male, so I suppose uh, getting his hand caught under a log at work with a right, uh, sorry, a left ring finger open P3 fracture and a nail bed injury. Uh, the nail bed injury was repaired and he was placed in a soft dressing after bedside ID, got ANSEP and tetanus in the ED and sent out on Keflex. A 35 year old male with a left distal radius fracture, so that's supposed to fall while playing soccer. He was neurovascularly intact, closed reduced, and placed into a sugar tongue splint. It's a 72 year old female, so that's supposed to be can't fall with a left radius fracture. She was neurovascularly intact, closed reduced, and placed into a sugar tongue splint. This is a 75 year old female, so that's supposed to fall with a right proximal humor fracture. 
neurovascular intact, including axillary nerve, it made non white bearing its thing. Those are some nice reductions. Good job. Good morning. Uh, first patient is a 48 year old female, fell from a lawn chair, uh, presented with this uh, left both bone uh, forearm fracture. It was a closed injury. The patient was neurovascularly intact. The patient was provisionally splinted and taken to the operating room for open reduction and internal fixation. Next patient so, is a 46. So, Dan, with, with that case, what, tell us about your interval to get down to the radius. What was your inner nervous plane, if you will? Yeah, so um, we did a Volar Henry approach between brachioradialis and FCR. And then uh, for the ulna, uh, we went uh, between ECU and SEU. Next patient is a 46 year old male, um, had his hand caught by a garage door, presented with this uh, left uh, perilunate dislocation, tricartium fracture, and radial styloid fracture. Uh, patient um, was neurovascularly intact on presentation, close reduced. CT was obtained to further characterize uh, fracture pattern, associated injuries. And the uh, patient was taken uh, for a uh, open reduction for cutaneous pinning. Next patient is a 17 year old female uh, presented after a crush injury um, with a right small finger tough fracture and distal tip amputation. The patient was taken for an irrigation and debridement and uh, VY advancement flat. What okay. was the pathology on the trans radial styloid? Uh, fracture, what, what ligaments were repaired? So um, we repaired the uh, SL ligament uh, posteriorly, uh, dorsally rather. And where did that come off? Um, it, <clears throat> excuse me, it came off of the lunate. Is that an anchor in the lunate? It is, correct. And are you saying that the ligament attaches to that spot where the anchor is? Um, Intraoperatively, it seemed that the ligament was attaching in that position, so uh, that's where we anchored it. Is it possible for the ligament to be that ulnar? Are you sure you didn't repair the capsule? No, we, we clearly were able to see the capsule. The capsule, although it was, um, you know, uh, it was injured, you know, when, once we uh, opened up the, once we did the approach, we saw the capsule was torn but we were able to see this ligament clearly uh, beneath the capsule. And is there anything attached to the radial styloid fragment? Uh, I mean, I, I imagine brachioradialis is still attached there. Does anything attach to the radial portion of the radius? Any important ligaments? The radius capitate. Okay. And does does where does that attach on the radial styloid? I mean, I imagine it would attach where that radial styloid fracture may be. Well, how that far may... from the tip of the radial styloid does the ligament attach? Because if that's the case, wouldn't you just fix that, not put all these other pins in? I'm honestly, not sure the distance that it attaches at. So you can, you can take five millimeters of the radial styloid of the tip out and there's nothing attached to it. So it doesn't start attaching until six millimeters, but it's kind of unusual to have a transradial styloid fracture with a scaphalunate dissociation where no ligament is attached to it all at, at all. And normally one would pin the radial styloid. I'm just wondering because you didn't pin it, maybe you thought nothing was attached to it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, once we you know, did our fixation, we felt that it was stable. And I'm sure the fixation is stable. The pins look perfect. The, the wrist looks perfect. The alignment looks perfect. It looked perfect before you put the pins in as well. Why would one, why do people pin these even if the post-reduction x-rays look perfect? Um, so, I mean, 
especially with our ligament repair, we want to give it the best uh, chance of uh, healing and uh, promote future stability. I mean, there's a, there's a high risk of instability moving on, moving forward with these types of injuries. Right. So they tend to, they tend to displace. If you put them in a splint, there's no perfect position to hold it. That's why you pin it, but your reduction happened to be excellent. Um, so I guess the, does the, the attending think there was anything attached to the radial styloid? I mean, we felt that it was pretty well reduced. I know it's reduced. I'm just wondering why normally we put a pin in the radial styloid. Maybe he thought there was nothing attached to it. You can pin everything else. And if it's, if the radial styloid displaces, when you end up, if there's anything really attached to it, you're not going to end up with what you see right now. Also, did you make a volar incision and did the patient have any carpal tunnel symptomatology? Uh, we did not make a volar incision and uh, uh, the patient did not have any uh, median nerve symptoms. And how long are you going to leave the pins in? I'm sorry? How long are you going to leave the pins in? Um, uh, you know, probably between four to six weeks. I think you want to leave them in longer than that. Well, how long does it take for this to heal? Yeah, so I mean, we're mostly concerned about ligamentous healing at this point. I mean, we did put the anchor in. Um, so probably upwards, maybe six to eight weeks, perhaps, if not longer. Normally, it's two to three months for this to heal. So I think the, the alignment you have is, is excellent. I think the things you should go, think about when you do cases like this in retrospect is what's attached to the radial styloid? Why is my anchor so close to the middle of the lunate and so far from where it normally should be? And why did I put a pin from the triquetrum into the hamate? You should think about that so that the next time you do it, you have a better idea. You should know why you're doing what you're doing because I'm not really sure why that pin is there. Even though it looks perfect, you should always critique it so you prepare yourself for the next time you come across one of these. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. <clears throat> First, we have a right hand dominant 77 year old male. So that's what's the ground will fall with this right distal radius fracture. He's closed, reduced, less than tissue, tall slid. He'll follow up in the office to discuss some surgical management. Next, we have a right hand dominant 33 year old male. That's what's ground will fall. He's taking out the trash. This left fifth metacarpal neck fracture. It's closed, reduced, plays into an ulnar gutter splint. Uh, he'll follow up in the office. Next to a 68 year old male, uh, that's what's a gravel fall. Um, several months ago, uh, he had continued pain. Uh, he never sought, sought care. Uh, he continued pain, and then he uh, hit his foot again at work um, recently. He had this. He was found to have this right navicular and uh, chronic cuboid fracture. <clears throat> this patient is placed into a uh, posterior splint uh, and he'll follow up in the office as well. Next, we have a right-hand dominant 23-year-old male. So that's what's gravel will fall. This uh, right proximal ulna fracture, coronoid fracture, is provisionally splinted. We'll take it to the OR for ORIF. He'll follow up in the office in two weeks. Thank you. What, the screws that are uh, on the last case, it looks like they're going anterior to the bone. Do you have x-rays showing that they're in the bone? You mean uh, anterior to like the coronoid? You, you, you have better x-rays showing that that's definitely perfectly in the bone, right? I'm saying uh, this one here? Yeah. Here, when we took our uh, um, I guess the, this is our save, but 
Uh, yeah, this one doesn't look as good. But uh, when we took our, our uh, floor, we did live, and we were able to see that we were in. You guys it should it get looks in. like your anterior fragment is not completely reduced. And I don't know, did you make an incision and kind of come up all, along the anterior medial side to see that fragment? Yeah, exactly uh, what we did. Um, and we tried to, you know, free up any soft tissue that might have been inter interposed or get rid of any hematoma, but um, we were having trouble uh, reducing. I think one of the things that um, I was described, has been described to try and, um, you know, Get a better look at these fractures is you know, when you have an associated electronon fracture you can probably uh, opened it and, and went uh, trans trans particular uh, and tried to reduce the coronoid there we didn't do that in this case just because uh, we thought it might have disrupted what was already a kind of a okay position of the electronon so can you like it's off a touch but i think it's i think that's the joint is well aligned i think it's just hinged open a little bit but i think it's perfectly acceptable i think the screws might be a little long there but i think that's fine too not going to cause a problem. Okay. Joe Mar, what, what, let's say the screws, and I, I think Carlos is absolutely right, but let's say those screws were five millimeters longer. What nerve would be at risk for irritation from those screws? You're concerned at that point about the AIN, your interosseous nerve. And how would you test for that clinically in your post op exam? FBL uh, is probably the, the one you'd want to isolate. Flexion of the what else is it? Interphalangeal joint. Pardon me. What else would be uh, if this those screws from the, the dorsal to come in a volley might be an issue if they're long in the front? Uh, there's also the uh, vasculature that's running uh, down along. Well, less so vasculature. Does the radial head move around? Is there a does. joint there? It, there is. Okay. And. Uh, does it, where does the cap um, the coronoid articulate with? Uh, where else? But is there a coronoid fossa on the humerus? Yes. All right, sorry. Uh, so if the screws are long in the coronoid, uh, gotcha. Do you think you'll so you, you is it uh, think there? Okay. You get yeah. Finish. Thank you. Morning. Uh, first case, 60 year old female status post fall with a left lateral to left foot fracture. BT scan was obtained. Sorry, my CT scans are not playing. Um, it's a lateral tibial plateau fracture with about five, uh, five millimeters of like condylar widening, uh, no significant depression. Um, she was then taken uh, for a, uh, a tibial plateau RIF uh, using a synthes uh, match plate. Uh, next patient is a 68-year-old female status with fall with left uh, hip uh, periprosthetic Vancouver AG fracture uh, made protected uh, weight-bearing with no active abduction. How old was the HEMI? Uh, the HEMI, HEMI was about a year old. Uh, next is an 86 year old male status post fall with an FLS fracture. Not really sure why. Uh, next is a 94 year old female status post fall with a right bimal uh, ankle fracture. Placed into a short AO slim. Next is an eight-year-old female status post fall with a right uh, distal both bone forearm fracture. It's closed reduced and placed into a uh, sugar tongue splint. Uh, 
morning. Uh, first patient is an 84 year old male who fell uh, outside while watering his plants. He sustained this left humeral shaft fracture. He was neurovascularly intact and clothes reduced, placed into a coaptation, splint, and cuff and collar, and was also neurovascularly intact prior, uh, post reduction. Next patient is a 59 year old male who um, was involved in a motor vehicle collision 10 days ago. For, at an, I went to an outside facility as he also had multiple facial fractures, bilateral orbital wall fractures, complicated by a cranial nerve six palsy, uh, rib fractures. He was uh, transferred um, a week after his injury uh, due to the cranial nerve palsy for uh, ophthalmology evaluation. Um, he was then um, found to have an incidental, um, or not incidental, he was found to have a delayed um, diagnosis of a left scapular fracture. He was uh, neurovascular intact and placed into a sling for comfort. We bear this uh, Next patient is a 20 year old male who punched a gas tank in Puerto Rico. Um, he was initially splinted in a short um, bowler resting splint in Puerto Rico as his x-rays were initially read as negative. He then came back from his vacation, um, presented to our emergency department with um, persistent right uh, wrist pain and difficulty with pronosupination. He was found to have this right distal ulna dislocation. He was otherwise neurovascular intact, flows reduced and placed into a sugar tongue splint and pronation. Uh, next patient is a 10 year old female who uh, stuck her hand in a washer. So just, just go back to those initial x-rays of the uh, dislocation. So you can see the stable way notch is not congruent here. So um, yeah, that's, that's something just you know, look at look at that tray on the left, and you know, your mind's got to tell you something's not right because the the ulnar head's not sitting in the same one notch. So that's something that an ER doctor might miss, but you shouldn't miss that. Can you show the reduction film again? Yeah, there you go. So why does it end up wide on that AP view? We sometimes see that. What's going on there? Um. You know, I'm not, I'm not, he, I mean, he certainly still has, he has an injury to his DRUJ. Um, there might be some interposed tissue in there. I'm not, you know, I'm not hundred percent sure. He's also really, you know, very swollen there. Um, Once you reduce it, was it stable? Yeah, he was stable after, you know, after the reduction, it was a very like palpable plunk back into place. Um, he was, when he initially presented, he had like absolutely zero pronosupination. He was completely stuck in like a semi-supinated um, position. But afterwards I took him, I was using, I used fluoroscopy um, and I took him through a full range of motion, chronosupination, flexion extension, and it was, it was completely stable. And I, I might, it might be hard to see, but does it look like there's a possible old ulnar styloid non-union in there on the AP that you're showing? Yeah, I thought, uh, on like, uh, I could really only see it on this view. And when I was using fluoro, I didn't really appreciate it. Um, I didn't see it until I put did, did these like post splint films. I didn't really see anything on the initial um, injury x-rays that made me concerned for it at all. Um, I'm not sure if it's just an artifact of the splint, but when we see him in the clinic, I know it's gonna get new x-rays and we can get a better view with the splint off. What ligaments do you think are torn to allow that injury to occur? Um, probably the, the volar uh, distal radial ulnar ligaments. You know, he might also have a um, like TFC tear as well, um, especially if he has this like ulnar styloid fracture. But in order to get the volar dislocation, I think the volar ligaments need to be torn. How long, and how long are you going to mobilize them? Um, I read uh, some varying reports. There was a case report. I think volar dislocations are pretty uncommon compared to the normal like dorsal dislocations. They're recommending putting like three to four weeks of an above elbow, like long arm cast, um, and then transitioning after that, if, as long as it's stable at the follow-up x-rays to a, a short arm cast that's well molded um, for two to three weeks. So overall, maybe like six weeks, six, seven weeks. Uh, the next patient is a 10 year old female who stuck her hand in a washer um, and sustained this uh, closed right um, distal radius, non displaced radial head, and humeral shaft fractures. Uh, she was neurovascularly intact. Um, here are the x rays of her humeral shaft fracture, which was spiral mid shaft, this uh, non displaced uh, radial head fracture. 
and then her uh, distal radius fracture. Um, she was um, sedated and then um, discussion was had with the on-call physician who elected for non-operative management. And we did a closed reduction of the distal radius, um, which was placed into a sugar tongue splint followed by a uh, closed reduction of her um, humeral shaft fracture and she was placed into a co-optation splint and a cuff and collar as well. What do you have to watch that kid for, Anna? I'm sorry, what was that? What do you have to watch for in that kid? So uh, especially with these like quote unquote floating elbow injuries, you have to be concerned for um, compartment syndrome which is slightly increased risk. Um, I actually read this report from 2020 in JPO that there, you know, I think historically there's an increased risk and you're a lot more concerned, which is why, you know, I think all, um, historically these were treated um, operatively. I think the JPO 2020 report actually reported, I think this is actually just specifically in supercondylars too, that it was a pretty low risk. It was like 2% or less, um, but she was definitely extensively counseled the, the mom on uh, signs and symptoms to look out for. Let's say it stays in this position. When you see her at one week, how are you going to treat her? Um, I think there's a couple options. Um, one is like, I, I think a hanging arm cast might be able to fit this. I don't think kids really tolerate that very well though. Um, and then the other option I think is to put her in a short arm cast for the distal radius um, and then put her in a, a functional brace for the, um, for the uh, radial, uh, not radial, sorry, the um, humeral shaft fracture. Did you say she had a radial head injury as well? Yes, it's like a non-displaced radial head injury. Um, I can really only see it on the, on the, the AP views um, of her uh, elbow. Um, but I mean, she's gonna be in the splint, um, you know, probably for a week or, you know, seven to 10 days, and she can probably start to move through the elbow um, because it's non-displaced anyways, so. I don't know. I think a long arm cast for everything. Deirdre, is that how you would do this one? Yeah, I'd put this in a long arm cast. And I mean, when I do my hanging arm cast, I just put them in a cuff and collar instead of a regular sling. Um, or you could cut out the back of the sling because uh, kids do tend to take off um, the sling portion or the cuff and collar portion a lot. Hopefully a 10 year old would listen, but I would probably do this in a long arm cast. I mean, the, the humeral shaft fracture is probably stuck in some soft tissue, so I don't know the gravity would necessarily completely fix that. And the deformity is acceptable. I just, you know, not stressed about that. Uh, first patient is a nine year old female who fell off her horse as the same as left type three supracondylar humerus fracture. No, she did have a median nerve palsy preoperatively. She was taken, or sorry, she was initially placed into a posterior splint, <coughs> taken for a CRPP. Uh, postoperatively, she still did have paresthesia as the median distribution, but her deficits have resolved. This is a nine-year-old male, status post fall uh, with a left distal both on forearm fracture. Uh, yeah, it was closed reduced, placed to a sugar tongue splint. It's a 14 year old male, status post fall with a left sulfur harris to distal radius fracture. He presented nine days after his injury and his swelling had resolved. He was placed into a short arm cast. It's a 30 year old male, status post fall with a left middle third clavicle fracture. He had a prior history of multiple fractures of the clavicle. He had undergone uh, an ORAF followed by a revision for a periprosthetic fracture and then removal of hardware. And then this, uh, that was all seven years prior. Uh, and then this occurred um, due to the shortening as uh, deformity, uh, he was taken electively for a left clavicle ORAF. Is a 27 year old female who crashed into a tree while practicing riding her motorcycle and sustained a right humeral shaft fracture. She was initially placed into a coaptation splint and then during follow up was found to be developing a non union. This is at two months. Uh, it's still mobile at the fracture site. 
Uh, I do not have the, uh, any imaging from the most recent follow-up, but at five months, she was taken for this right humerus ORF after uh, inflammatory labs were negative, uh, cultures were taken and were also negative. Why did you have to wait for five months? I definitely did not have to, uh, but she was lost to follow up for a period of time. What, why did you take cultures? And um, you didn't operate the first time, right? So this patient was initially taken uh, to do these, this humerus ORAF and uh, when she was exposed down to the fracture site, there is some sort of seroma, uh, which- was You concerned. know what that's called at five months? No. No, it's just it's not, not a It was not a arthrosis. It was a giant sebaceous cyst. It looked like a, uh, literally looked like a gallon of pus. It was just a nasty cyst. Mm, that's, that would be unusual. <laughs> Uh, but it was, it was very strange, but what you looked at it, it literally looked like you got into a big pocket of pus. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. So we drained it, cultured it. I had a feeling it was going to be a sterile sebaceous cyst, but, you know, we just, uh, it'd be stupid to put hardware in and find out it was ended up being an abscess for some reason. So we cultured it, closed her up, brought her back a week later and did the case and we ran into another one. Hmm. Well, so negative. Go back to the, uh, the non-union films real quick. Almost looks like there's some sort of lucency in the bone maybe that's a cyst i don't know this is uh, the bone looked normal i think that's just usual atrophic stuff going on there she's a smoker non-smoker todd what's the uh is there literature on non-unions and humerus fractures when you start should start worrying about if it yeah, doesn't so, heal so at six weeks if they still have pain and motion at the fracture site then their risk of going on to non-union is very high. It's like over 90%. Yeah. So you can have that discussion that you can um, essentially say you, it's likely not going to heal. You could, you could have done it at around two months versus five if she followed up potentially. Yeah, absolutely. So this, this patient had only just followed up with uh, the surgeon just prior, just at this five-month point. Um, they had been seeing someone else prior to that. What, what, approach, the, what approach did you take? Uh, anterolateral. Can you we explain? Did, 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 uh, did you did. compress across the fracture site? We did. So can you explain how those two plates work together in compression? So we, first we put the four or five plate anterior and it's got compression at the fracture site, but there's still some micro motion. Uh, so we added that three, five plate laterally just to add stability. I don't think there was micro motion after that four or five plate, just that some of her distal screws in that four or five plate, just her bone was not great and just did not feel like the best purchase with those screws. So I just, to be safe, I put another plate on it. It's still loaded in, still loaded in compression, but it, I don't, I'm not sure it got us any added compression. Did, did you bone graft it? Yeah. And where did you get the bone from? It was, uh, um, it was just can't sell bone chips. We use some of her callus, we use some chips and we put some DBX buddy. Is there literature in terms of with humeral shaft specifically non-union? Well, do you need the bone graft necessarily? Uh, Assuming it's straightforward non-union. I don't think it's strictly necessary. I don't think there's data specifically saying it's better or worse. There's HSS paper that says you don't really need it. Did that paper differentiate hypertrophic non-unions and atrophic non-unions? I think that paper was all comers. So yeah. You gotta be really careful. This was an atrophic non-union, so. I, 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 I agree with, if you're already there and it's atrophic, it just add the biology. I think the majority of these are also more spiral. So you can really get a nice couple of three, five compression, you know, lag screws and then plate it. Um, this is just purely mainly transverse. I just, I worry about this more than the other ones. One more question, Todd. They, on your initial films, is there anything on her initial films that would have concerned you that she might not do well in non-operative? Uh, yeah, just as transverse. No, the, her habitus. She has a large habitus. 
so, so either deformity or healing problems also and also more, females they tend to go into the aris more oh for obvious reasons but there's newer literature uh for example jot in 2019 level one studies that show that the complications from non-operative treatment of humeral fractures is not as low as Sarmiento's original papers. Right. It'd be as high as 30% complication, including 17 for non-unions. Yep. Yeah, yeah Sarmiento quoted. Just, Sarmiento's paper was uh, a little bit, there's a lot of loss of all of there. And he had 98% union rate, which we know is not true, but in Vandy paper that Pushin's talking about, it's probably yeah, a good 20 to 30% non-union, which I don't necessarily think that's true either. It's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Uh, did you go low enough to see the radial nerve? Uh, we, we actually did go and found, we found the radial nerve uh, distally. Uh, this is a 72-year-old female, Sasso's fall with a right olecranon fracture. Uh, she has Parkinson's. She was taken for a right olecranon ORF with a tension band construct. The 17 year old female status MBC with a closed right foot with a lumbar fracture. She was initially uh, placed into a sugar tongue splint and taken for a right foot with a forearm ORF. The 50 year old male status fall with a right distal radius fracture. He was narrow intact, it was a closed injury. Uh, closed reduction was attempted. Uh, but he has a lot of comminution dorsally and it fell backwards. Uh, he's going to follow up for likely surgical management. This is a 58 year old male who fell off a forklift and sustained this left ring finger PIP joint dislocation. As a simple dislocation, he was reduced and uh, placed into a dorsal splint and body tape. He was stable to range of motion afterwards. A 64 year old male, uh, SAS was MBC with a right femoral neck intertroche and shaft fracture, as well as a patellar tendon rupture. Everything was closed. Uh, CT pelvis was obtained to better delineate the fracture pattern, showing this non displaced femoral neck with the intertroche component. He underwent an antegrade right femur intramedullary nail, as well as a patellar tendon repair. And what was your sequence? Uh, we did, in the fracture table first, we did the antegrade nail after uh, obtaining a reduction there. And then once the nail was completed, uh, we went on to uh, Skytron and did the patellar tendon supine. Did you do just regular incisions as you would for a intramedullary nail or did you open anything? No, we didn't have to open anything. Uh, we were able to get a good reduction close. This is an 83 year old female, Sasso's fall at the beach with a right tibial plateau fracture. She was placed into a bulky knee immobilizer and will be made non-weight bearing. This is a 43 year old male, Sasso's MPC with an open type 3A right tibial uh, pilon fracture, a left subtalar fracture dislocation, a left Weber afibular fracture, and a left tibial plateau fracture. Uh, these are the initial x-rays of the pilon. Uh, there is a, a few centimeter wound posteriorly. Uh, CT was obtained. The left subtalar fracture dislocation, which was closed reduced, placed into a short AO splint initially. CT was obtained post reduction.
and a non-displaced lateral tibial plateau fracture. The right tibia underwent an IND, an external fixator the same day. And then two weeks later, the left uh, talus and distal fibula were taken for an ORIF, as well as a talo cuneiform arthrodesis. And they write peel on removal of X6 and ORIF. Do you guys look at the joint? Uh, yeah. And you thought about adding, sliding up something medially just because it's so comminuted? Uh, yeah, so uh, there was thought given to that. I think that the thought process was just because of all the comminution that we just wanted to bridge everything and leave the uh, uh, comminuted areas alone. For secondary healing there. Well, if you if you slide it up, you're not dissecting it out. You're just adding. So what's gonna? What's the concern? What's the deformity that may develop? Uh, you could go into varus. Yeah, because all your fixation is laterally, giving you kind of valgus buttress, and you have all your comminution in the shaft and medially. So you have to keep a close eye on it because it'll, depending on how quickly it heals, it'll slowly start falling into that. And there's, there are papers that show that adding a, um, something to prevent virus collapse does help prevent virus collapse. Is this something you'll bone graft in six weeks? Well, I would certainly uh, consider it, Dave, depending on the x-rays. Thanks. The three-year-old female who fell three days prior to presentation uh, landed on her left elbow. She had continued elbow pain, so her mom took her to a pediatrician uh, who sent her for outside x-rays, uh, which uh, she was then told that she had an elbow fracture and told to follow up with ortho, so she came to our emergency room. There's this type one supracondylar humerus fracture. Uh, she was neuromuscularly intact. She uh, was placed in a bivalve lung on cast and follow up in the office. Um, and then a 97 year old female starts with ground level fall, found out it's left uh, super inferior. Uh, first phase of 51 year old female, uh, size was pedestrian struck with this right closed uh, shaft fracture. She's taken to the operating room for an intramedullary nail. The next patient is a 17 year old uh, boy, uh, size was fall from this right closed external shaft fracture. Uh, he would be running and then his foot uh, got planted and twisted and caused a fracture. He had no antecedent pain. Uh, we performed an MRI preoperatively that was native for any sort of uh, oncologic or cyst uh, fracture site. We also performed a metabolic workup and he found that lower by D. He was taken for an uh, integrated uh, femur nail. It will be supplemented by me postoperatively. Uh, next patient's a 41 year old male, so that's most unknown injury. Uh, he was found down. Um, Intoxicated, uh, suspected to have been assaulted. He had his closed uh, right distal femur shaft fracture on the right. On the left side, he had a soft tissue injury uh, to his left posterior knee that was a necrotomy uh, and also involved a laceration of uh, his common perineal nerve, uh, biceps femoris. Um, he also did for an MRI that found a uh, Okay, and this is tear and ACL tear and an LCL injury. He was taken to the operating room for an IND wound exploration of his uh, left knee. 
and then for his right femur, he had a retrograde femur. Next patient is a 65 year old male, status post fall, had his right subcapital femoral neck fracture. Uh, he was an active, healthy individual. He was taken to the operating room for a right total hip. Next patient is a 44 year old female, sad to fall down the stairs, present with bilateral closed ankle fractures. Dan, can some. you go back to the injury films on that femoral neck? Yeah. So it's, uh, these are the films subcapital. It's in a little bit of varus and it's a little bit translated for anteriorly. So it's fully displaced, a little bit of varus, and he's a healthy, active individual. So I think the best operation for him would be a total that would give him maximal. Function. Didn't want to try cannulator screws? I think you can, but I think in, in the cases where you have um, you know, some various alignment and you're going to have to the, the best surgery for them would probably be the total hit. What's his full story? He uh, fell so, two so, weeks so, ago, so, had a oh, little yeah, bit so of also, pain, yeah, two weeks, went to work. Yeah. So he, he had actually had like an injury two weeks ago and him had been walking on it and he continued to have uh, some pain and presenting again after that period of time. So he, he had, had functionally tried to... Uh, he had started to have worsening pain that brought him to the emergency room now. So it's likely his valgus impacted head was starting to fall off. Yeah, I don't see Varus. I would say Valgus impacted. If he's walking on it for two weeks, I think it's maybe proven itself to be stable. And I don't think you could be faulted for putting screws in that and seeing what happens. Oh, well, it hasn't been proven stable. He's having this has been having more and more pain. That's why he came to the emergency room now. He has he started, have pain started with a broken bone. Well, that's because he's walking on it. Yeah. <laughs> he, I mean, I don't well, think he, that proved. I don't think that proved it was unstable. In my mind, this is a valgus impacted, and if that were my hip, try the screws first, guys. This is not significantly displaced. That history of increasing pain means nothing. The the valgus impacted that tend to fail are the ones that are already falling off, either retro. Or, I don't know, but I've probably fixed several hundred of these, and we convert very few of them to total hip, and very few of them have significant post-traumatic arthritic changes or anything else. I think a minimal operation, I don't know what the, the rest of the history of this guy is, but it seems three screws is pretty minimal compared to the total hip, maybe not a reliable person. Dan, what was it like when you went in there and were kind of dislocating the hip? Was it together or did it pop right apart? There, there was some, uh... There's some instability uh, we had encountered during the operation. Uh, we had to, no. Dan, what he's saying is when you, when, you, when you dislocated the hip, did the whole ball come out with the, the everything came out as one or was the ball left behind? Most uh, of it stayed in there. It kind of levered through that fracture side when you internally rotated it. Right, but when it came out, did, did the neck come out by itself and the ball behind or did the head and neck come out together? The, the, the head stayed in the cup. Our next patient, a 44 year old female, status was fall with bilateral closed ankle fractures. These are her actually to the left. Right. She was taken to the operating for open mechanical fixation. Uh, we went up prone and addressed uh, both of these simultaneously. Next patient's a right hand down is a 17 year old male. He was assessed with fall while playing football. And his left both on form fracture. He was scaly mature. He was taking the operating room for open ocean and Next patient is a 49 year old male, size was fall, presented with uh, a left open ankle fracture, dislocation. He was washed down in the emergency room, received antibiotics, splinted, induced, taking the operating room 
for overdraft utilization. Fortunately, our uh, non stress is not safe. Oh, sorry, uh, the slide got deleted. Um, also, did a uh, ductal ligament uh, a repair, uh, repair suture anchor. Was the deltoid ligament interposed in there? That's just interesting that it didn't reduce all the way. I, it was completely kind of uh, like a ball, a ball soft, you know, extensive uh, like soft tissue and capsule injury interoperative. Did you look at the fluoro prior to the surgery and see whether it reduced? Sorry, so it was a question. Sorry, Dr. Butler. The question is almost always I check the see whether these things reduce prior to doing the surgery just with a fluoro shot. You should be able to see how whether it's reducible or not if something is blocking the medial side. So it, we, we were able to get it uh, reduced. This, this one was wide open medially. Look, you're looking into the joint and see the ligament torn and the capsule completely shredded. This was a wide open 3A ankle. Why does the talus look like it's angulated? Because we're stressing it to see if the syndesmosis widens, but the syndesmosis doesn't widen, but the, because there's a soft tissue injury immediately, the talus still tilts. Do you have a non-stress picture? It, 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 didn't, it got deleted, sorry, that's why I said it's not there. We, at, at the end, that's why we, I, I put a suture anchor to just hold it down because it's just, it's just circum, like, there was no capsule anymore attached. There was nothing, no ligaments anywhere. This is one I think you gotta be careful and probably cast it for a while. They can get in trouble even with your lateral buttress plate. Morning. First patient is a 40 year old male who's involved in MVC. Uh, came in as a trauma with his right uh, hip uh, dislocation and posterior wall, his tabular fracture. Trauma uh, team identified the hip dislocation with x rays and it was nice enough to get a CAT scan before we had a chance to reduce it. It was then reduced in the trauma bay after the back, sent back for a CAT scan. Better delineate the fracture pattern. And take it in the following morning for an acetabular ORF. Next is a 77 year old male who sustained a trip and fall, this uh, right displaced from neck fracture. He was taken for a right hip hemiarthroplasty. Sorry, that one picture is a little distorted. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. Uh, next is a 61 year old female sustained a trip and fall with this right tibial plateau fracture. Uh, she was provisionally uh, reduced and then splinted in the ER and taken the following day for a X fix. And approximately two weeks later, taken for a right tibial plateau removal of X fix and ORF plateau. Next is a 29 year old female who's riding one of the electric scooters around town here. Uh, uh, fell off with this left tibial plateau fracture. She was provisionally placed in an X fix and again taken. Sorry, here's the CAT scan. And after the X fix, and then taken in delayed fashion for a left tibial plateau or F. Andrew, is there a time that you want to get the X fix off? And the only reason I asked that was just consulted on a risk case where there was an infection uh, plating subsequent to an external fixator. What's the literature say on these tibia fractures? Uh, on the tibia fractures, I don't know off the top of my head, but I know for the femur fractures, that old, uh, the classic article out of um, shock trauma showed that you could X fix a femur fracture 
for I believe over 21 days and have, and then fix it to the nail and have no increased risk of infection. Uh, usually tibia, we wait about two weeks. Tibias, tibias tornadus, there's a paper on tibias and XX removal. Tibias, okay. It's two weeks. Two weeks. Um, under two weeks, there's no difference. Under two weeks, as long as there is no frank sign of a pin track infection. Yeah, as long as exactly there's no, already no infection. That. So, if you're taking one off a of peel on at say 15 days, what you do anything differently? Sorry, I just wanted you kind of broke up a little bit. What was that? If you're taking a X fix off a of peel on say at, at 15 days and you're going to plate it, what, what do you do differently? If you know there's a higher risk, what are we doing? I tend to any XFX curette the pin sites and irrigate with dilute beta then, but that's me for every XFX, not just the the, the delayed ones. Mm -hmm. AG, I've always followed a protocol where you take the XFX off sterilely and clean the pin tracks and then reprep and drape with new instruments. Mm -hmm. Is there any thought given to placing the XFX out of the zone? Possible fixation as well when you're going to, especially like a pylon or well, a I, plateau. Ken Koval did have a paper at a joint disease that when they overlapped the fixation for the external fixator pin sites, where there was no increased risk of infection. But I still think it, it's a good idea. Next is a 27 year old male who was running from the cops after robbing Best Buy, jumped over a fence. This right tubule shaft, uh, shaft fracture, as well as a posterior malfracture. Uh, Extras of the ankle shown, posterior mal piece. Uh, he's taking the OR for right tibia, I'm now, and then uh, posterior mal, ORF. Thank you. Thank you. 